This video is an introduction to Data as a Service. Data as a Service is a new architectural approach to developing business solutions developed by Great Ideas and implemented as part of the Trellis framework. This video will attempt to answer five basic questions. Initially, what problems are we trying to solve with the Data as a Service approach to software architecture? What makes the approach different to other traditional approaches? What are the underlying architectural principles that make Data as a Service different? How have we addressed sustainability within Data as a Service? What are the service areas within the Data as a Service architect? Finally, we will look at some next steps to get a deeper dive into how data as a service architecture works. So let's start by looking at the problems that we're trying to solve. The biggest problem in IT is the fuzzy business requirements. What happens here is that business users have a general sense of what they want to achieve and they tell us what they want us to implement. We go away, we execute it, we bring it back, we show it to the business user and they go, yep, that's what I said but not quite what I want. Can you make these changes? Can you enhance this? I think you misunderstood that. And the longer the development cycle between the business user saying what they want and us showing them our actual implementation, the worse it is. It involves more cost, it involves more effort, it involves more risk. Ideally, we want the shortest development cycle possible. In an ideal world, a business user will say what they want we will build it, immediately get feedback, and iterate around that. So the shorter the development cycle, the better. Once we get past business requirements issues, we now have to deal with architectural issues. Many organizations do not have a well-defined solution architecture. They go through an evolutionary approach, which means that over time, as business needs change, as particular applications and technologies go out of support and need to be replaced, we end up buying or building new solutions. This leads to many applications being implemented over time. Each of these applications may have a different security model for authentication and authorization. This means that it becomes difficult for users who now have to enter information into multiple applications using multiple accounts, multiple passwords, and this also generates gaps in the security model where information may be compromised. This also means that we end up with many technologies. So each of these applications that have been bought over time potentially is running on a different technology. It may be running on .NET, it may be running on LAMP, it may be Java based, it may be something that's 20 years old running on VB6. And we end up with a proliferation of technologies, too few staff to maintain them. The other issue at the architectural level is data is hidden within applications and services and this creates issues with integration hairballs. So where we have data hidden within an application creating a data silo, it becomes difficult to integrate that data with information in other applications. And the integrations that we create are typically batch ETL jobs or real-time integrations using APIs. The other consequence of an evolutionary architectural approach is it becomes hard to identify and then implement a generic component. Clearly the problems arise one at a time, a solution to that particular problem is implemented, and then the next time we get the same problem, the technology that we implemented the first time is either obsolete or inappropriate for the particular implementation that we're now facing. At an application level, we have a different set of issues. The larger and more complex the application, the more fragile it is in operation. So the more we automate, the more code we write, the harder it then becomes to actually modify that code as new changes occur in the business operations. Typically, we also find within these applications that there is no real separation of concern within the code itself. So we could be looking at a form where the storage, presentation and workflow action is all ro rolled up into the code behind the form itself. This makes it difficult to add, remove or change something as simple as a field 
because we now have to modify the underlying data table. We need to modify the T-SQL that's accessing that data. We need to modify the user experience that's presenting that field, and we need to modify the code that's actually using that field. Clearly, these changes will have impacts across multiple fields and multiple APIs, and so we end up with a situation whereby making a change to a piece of code, we may have impacts in other pieces of code. This means it's hard to isolate and resolve errors within these applications, and we end up in a situation where the development team can actually become frightened of the code that they maintain because they're worried about making changes and breaking things. The development team may also take shortcuts in actually getting the solution into production, but this then causes operational headaches for the lifetime of the application. So now that we have a handle on the existing problems with solution development, let's have a look at an alternative solution architecture based around data as a service. We wanted to create a well-defined enterprise solution architecture. We've been working on this solution architecture for decades based on our experience in the field and a relentless innovation program to consistently look at how we can do things better. We started with a blank sheet and we threw away all of the traditional assumptions that are generally made when creating new applications. For example, that we had to create all of the data in a database in standard tables with columns and foreign keys. What we tried to do was systematically tackle all of the actual problems that we identified on the previous slide and do it in a holistic way. We were committed to building on industry standard best practices, patterns and technology and constantly innovating to make sure that the solutions we developed stayed up to date. The key differentiator of a data as a service architecture is the idea of creating data agnostic services and separating those services into specific service areas that each have a single responsibility. So we have a data at rest service area that is only dealing with secure storage of information. This could be record data, file data, emails, essentially where data is at rest, it's placed in secure storage. And that secure storage is at the heart of the system and is protected. The peripheral service areas shown in blue in the diagram are then exposing the data that we're protecting. Either we are presenting data through users, through a user experience. We are providing automated workflow through our data in action services, or we are sharing information with third parties, either internally or externally in our data in motion service area. One of the key aspects of the data as a service is what if we replace code with data? How far can we go using our data agnostic services, configuring using data in a database instead of having to write actual code in the application? A core technology developed for data as a service is the idea of dynamic user experience. This technology is implemented as a set of platform specific components. Each component is capable of rendering an entire user experience driven by data for either a website, a mobile application or a desktop application. What happens is that in real time, a user requesting a record from the database has a page generated dynamically using the information from the database, a form definition from the database, it understands the roles of the user, and it understands the state of the record being displayed. These cross-platform dynamic user experience components allow us to provide a true omni-channel user experience. Now let's review some of the guiding architectural principles of our data as a service architecture. Starting at the architectural level, the first thing we want to ensure is that every component that we build for our architecture has security and privacy built in by design in the component before we even start thinking about writing code. We're also going to make sure 
that all of the service areas implement a specific concern. So data at rest is where data is stored. Data presentation is only dealing with the presentation of information to a user. It does not store data, it does not execute workflow on data, it does not share data with third parties. By enforcing a strict separation of concerns by service area, we make it very clear from the outset in the architecture which components are performing which functions. We make one assumption that there is a dependency between any of the peripheral services and data at rest. This makes total sense because the peripheral services can't do their jobs if there is no access to the data at rest core service. So the data presentation service cannot display data if it can't access it. This single dependency means that data presentation cannot directly talk to data in motion or data in action. All communication between service areas is mediated through the data at rest service area. As we look at implementations of our components, we also need to be able to leverage a complete range of hybrid cloud solutions. We want to make sure that every single component is making the best use of the best available technology at any point in time. But we also need to manage the architecture to ensure that we're maintaining a minimal best of breed technology stack. We don't want to include technology within the architecture just because it happens to be the flavor of the month. We're looking for technology that is long lasting, that confers a real business benefit to our business users and is worth incorporating formally into our architectural platforms. A key advantage of having an enterprise architecture from the beginning is that we can also identify generic components. Where possible, we want to identify generic components early and implement them using configuration parameters so that we can repurpose them in different areas of the application. Now let's think about architectural principles at the component level. Obviously, it is an advantage to us to generate small components because these are easy to design, easy to understand, they're easy to deploy, and that makes them easier to maintain. And ultimately, a small component can be replaced easily as well. When creating a component, we're always going to look for solutions that allow us to avoid writing code where possible. This reduces the overall cost of the component during development because as well as reducing the amount of code, it also reduces the amount of testing and reduces the costs and risks associated with operational deployment. If there's nothing there to code, then there's nothing there to test and nothing there to maintain. Where we do have to write code, we're going to make sure that we write the highest possible quality code and make sure that we implement as much fault tolerance within that code as possible to reduce errors. We're also going to include extensive error logging to make it easy to isolate errors within each component. We're also going to make extensive use of automated testing. This enables us to set an expectation around what the code does and improve its overall quality. And then as the code is developed and evolved over time, we can always rerun it against its initial unit tests to make sure that we haven't broken anything in the process. A theme of the data as a service architecture is the idea of sustainability. We're not using sustainability in terms of climate change and the green revolution. When we talk about sustainability within service architectures, what we're talking about is building for change. The key idea here is that we need to be able to future-proof our business solutions for years into the future. This is increasingly difficult because business needs are constantly changing. New services and products are constantly being developed and new regulatory and legal frameworks are constantly being introduced. We also see that technical innovation is increasing 
new physical and virtual infrastructure and devices are emerging every year. The pace of change of technology is increasing exponentially. A solution that we develop this year will probably be obsolete within five years or 10 years, but business solutions last for decades. We also need to ensure that we're dealing with emerging services and components, processes and standards as they become available. We want to be able to relentlessly innovate our technology to stay ahead of the curve and not lag behind and end up with applications and components that are obsolete or are no longer supported. People are also an issue for sustainability. People come and go all of the time. We need to be able to onboard new resources quickly and bring them up to speed so they can be productive and add value to the organization. But equally, we can't also become dependent upon key resources and be worried that they will leave or retire we need to be constantly investing in our people to make sure that our staff have the skills that they need and are able to move between different components as needs arise. Now let's consider the architectural constraints of the components in each of the service areas. We'll start with data at rest. The primary concern of a component in the data at rest service area is the storage of data. This data could be records in a database, it can be files in a file system, it can be emails in an email system. Essentially we're talking about the storage of any data anywhere in the enterprise and as far as possible to make it completely data agnostic. It shouldn't matter whether I'm saving data about a person, a car, a house, a financial account, an insurance policy. We're looking for data agnostic storage. This is the only core service area and it must always be available to the other peripheral service areas. It's not possible to present data you can't access. So if the data at rest service area is not available, none of the other service areas are going to be able to do their jobs either. The data at rest service area contains the business data. This is the value. This is the ultimate target for any attacks from hackers. As such, it needs to be isolated from all external threats and protected by as many layered defenses as possible. This means that the data at rest is internal to the organization, is not exposed in any way to anything other than the peripheral service areas that all of those connections from the peripheral service areas are going through firewalls, they have intrusion detection, they have monitoring, they have alerting, as much defense as you can put between the peripheral service areas and the data at rest is fully justified. Within the data at rest service area, all data should be encrypted at rest and also during transport to other service areas. Information within the data at rest service area can only be accessed by authenticated and authorized users of one of the peripheral service areas. Access to data within data at rest will then be authenticated by the data at rest service as well. The data at rest components need to be optimized in two distinct ways. They need to be optimized for the storage of information and separately for the retrieval of information. This is important because retrieving information typically revolves around searching data and then retrieving data based on a particular key. Note that the data structures for storage and retrieval may be significantly different. We also need to ensure that our data at rest service area components are both vertically and horizontally scalable. This means that we can add vertically more processing power if we need to increase the capability of our storage and retrieval and optionally to add additional servers if we need to make it horizontally scalable if we're going to large scale. We need to make sure that our data in rest components are always backed up to secure vaults. The backups should also be encrypted as they are created, as they are transported and as they are stored. Because this is a core service area and must always be available to the other services, we need to make sure 
that the data at rest components are always designed to be highly available. Note that backups and high availability are not a replacement for disaster recovery. So we also need to ensure that our data at rest components also have appropriate disaster recovery options and are included in our business continuity planning activities. Now let's consider the architectural principles as they relate to the data presentation service area. Primary concern of a component in the data presentation service area is simply the display of information to authorized users. The display of data spans all application forms, reports, dashboards, notifications, analytics, anything that is in any way presenting information to a user of the solution. A prerequisite is that the user must be both authenticated and authorized to the data presentation component so that they can have secure access to the information being presented. Those authentication credentials are then going to be passed into the data at rest service area to again confirm access before data is exposed. The primary component of data presentation is the application form. We want to make application forms data agnostic. It shouldn't matter whether we're displaying information about a vehicle, a person, an insurance policy. It should be easy to represent any information on any form. And we're going to do this using our dynamic page generation technology. The dynamic page generation technology will provide basic create, read, update and delete or CRUD functionality. And this will include field level validation both as the data is being displayed and as the data is being saved back to the database. If a page rendered through dynamic page generation needs to initiate workflow, this is done by calling data at rest. So a request goes into the data at rest service area, which is then picked up by either components in the data in action or data in motion service areas. Once the request has been fulfilled, then the response then goes back to the user experience. The dynamic page generation technology should also support state transition. This enables us to reflect the life cycle of individual records. Components in the data presentation service area also need to be vertically and horizontally scalable. So as the demands of the system expand, it should be easier to either add more processing power or add additional servers to scale out the presentation layer. Ideally, the data presentation layer should also be highly available. Obviously, if the user cannot see the data, then the business cannot proceed. Next, let's consider the architectural principles in the service area for data in action. The primary concern of components in the data in action is the manipulation of data that already exists in the data at rest service area to deliver value. As always, user authentication and authorization will be required to provide secure access to any of the data in action components. And this authorization information is again passed into the data at rest components to ensure that the user has access to the information before it's being exposed to data in action. A data in action component can be anything. It can be a small T-SQL function resident inside a database that can deliver a single result in milliseconds right the way through to a large scale automated business process workflow that may span days and anything in between. Essentially, a data in action component is anything that can interface directly with the data at rest services in order to read information, manipulate that information, and then put that data back into the data at rest service area when it's completed. Each data in action component should encompass the minimum functionality required to achieve the desired result. It is not necessary to build large components which encompass several different functions. We can deploy single SQL stored procedures. We can imply web APIs that just have single functions. We can use serverless compute for example, an Azure function, we can use a logic app, potentially anything that is able to connect to a service area securely 
and manipulate information is a data in action component. Where possible, we would like to make sure that we're building generic and reusable components. Ideally, if we can deploy a component that we can configure in data to perform the same function in many different aspects, then we would like to use a generic component that can be configured in data. But if necessary, a highly specific business function can be deployed as well. Keeping our data in action components small means that they're easily to design, build and test. Once we have a component ready, we can then version it, deploy it and replace it at will. So for example, I might be dealing with an order processing function and I may be dealing with orders of a specific type. If the business requirements for processing that order change, it should be possible for me to deploy a new version of that order component without necessarily replacing the old version so that I can run both versions in parallel and at a future point in time when there are no orders of the first version in the system, I can then remove the old version. As ever, data in action components should be both vertically and horizontally scalable. That is either adding additional power to an existing server or adding additional servers should help me to scale the service as far as I require. We would also like our data in action components to be highly available. The final service area to consider is data in motion. The primary concern of this service area is the management of data flowing between our solution and other systems. Again, user authentication and authorization will be required for secure access to data flows between systems and the authentication will be passed into the data at rest service area to ensure that data is only being transported where authorized. These data flows could be internal between business units within the same organization or they could be external flows to customers, suppliers, partners or regulators. So essentially transport of any data between our data at rest components and any other external system, whether it's internal to the organization or external to that organization, goes through the data in motion components. Typically, the data in motion components will either perform basic ETL, so extract, transform and load operation over secured and encrypted channels in batch mode, or they could be using real-time APIs, service bus or queues for asynchronous communication. The aim of the data in motion components is to completely decouple our solution from any external dependencies. A key function of a data in motion component is to check the integrity of the information being transferred. This means that when data is received from an external data source, we need to ensure that it is valid before we attempt to save it in our data at rest components. We should also make sure that we are only sending information to external users that they are actually authorized to see. We want to make sure that as far as possible, we prevent any unauthorized data loss or export from our existing systems. As ever, we want data in motion components to be both vertically and horizontally scalable and we also need them to be highly available. Thank you for watching this introduction to data as a service. As you will appreciate, there is quite a lot of information that we were unable to cover in the introductory video. For those of you interested in a deeper dive in what data as a service is, we have presented a set of service area videos. Each of these videos covers the detailed architecture of the different service areas and the components that need to be created and how those components will interact. In addition, we have also produced a set of DevOps videos around how great ideas implements data as a service. One thing that we have found is that implementing data as a service significantly changes the way that you will interact with the business. So we have included a business analysis video to help you understand how to work with business users to rapidly develop data models and functionality and how to build custom user experience in real time with your business users. 
We have also included an Azure DevOps video to show you how Great Ideas works with the Microsoft tools to build our own application components. If you want a lot more detailed architectural information, please visit the greatideas.com website. Here we have hundreds of pages of architectural notes on data as a service, as an architecture, the individual service area components, and it also introduces our Trellis implementation. Trellis is a fully matured data as a service implementation that we have now been running for many years. We continuously innovate around the Trellis platform and as we develop new solutions, the greatideas.com website will be updated. Thank you for your attention. I hope the information that we have presented here has been useful to you. If you are interested in pursuing more information about data as a service, please feel free to reach out to us at greatideas.com.